Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the latest installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Advanced Analytics with William McKnight. Today, William will be discussing understanding the modern applications of graph databases. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A section, or if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And just to note, the Zoom chat defaults to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely change this to network with everyone. To find and open both the Q&A and the chat sections, you can find those icons in the bottom middle of your screen for those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now, let me introduce to you our speaker for the series, William McKnight. William has advised many of the world's best-known organizations. His strategies form the information management plan for leading companies in numerous industries. He is a prolific author and a popular keynote speaker and trainer. He has performed dozens of benchmarks on leading database, data lake streaming, and data integration products. William is a leading global influencer in data warehousing and master data management, and he leads McKnight Consulting Group, which has twice placed on the incorporated 5,000 list. And with that, I'll give the floor to William to get today's webinar started. William, hello and welcome. Hello, and thank you, Shannon. Coming to you hot today, in at least one way, I'm in Texas. That's how it is here. And I welcome you all to understanding the modern applications of graph databases. This is uh, always a, an interesting topic for everybody. I feel like graph databases have yet to have their their big day uh, in the sun in uh, in the form of being present in every enterprise. I'm a huge advocate though, and that may come through. I am not a full on graph guy, meaning that's not how I spend my day every day, all day, like some people. But I think that that's an okay thing to present this because. Uh, I see a lot of different architectures and different ways to do things, and I can kind of put things together in a good way, I think. And that's uh, what I'm going to do for you today for graph databases. I'm going to give you lots of case studies, use cases, if you will, and hopefully you can find your way in one or more of the use cases if you're not using graph already. There will be a little bit of graph 101. Uh, in here, just so that everybody can come along with uh, with me into the use cases. And at the end, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, an emerging technology that I'm I'm being asked a lot about that I think has some overlap to what we're talking about here today, and that's vector databases. So stay tuned for that. Now, let's start with uh, what technology do most graph databases get their bounce from? It would have to be relational databases. Now, graph databases uh, form the foundation for a lot of greenfield or new uh, applications that enterprises are taking on for the first time, of course. But at the same time, th there are a lot of relational databases out there trying to do graph things and uh, maybe the hard way and maybe there's an easier way. So we need to make that a priority to get those workloads over here. And I'll make the case a little bit here today why that would be. The idea of everything in columns and rows, really a thing of the past. A SQL becomes less important as technology involves. The technology of data will certainly evolve. We're certainly not sitting in any place in time where there's one size fits all and there's one place for all data and that's it. There are many places for data, and you have to get it right and get a, get the data flowing in the right way as well. And this does not mean that all data is in one and only one place. Certainly not. As a matter of fact, a lot of data that ends up in a graph database is somewhere else as well, but not for the workloads that the graph database supports. So graph is kind of like really the connecting topic out there. It's for these networks and relationships, as will be shown here. We can make better predictions by utilizing relationships. And a lot, a lot, lot of large companies are using this right now, and mid-sized companies as well. If you're using any Spotify list, that uses graph machine learning in the background. If you've used Google Maps, you've used graph machine learning. And there's also companies that give us 
medication, any drugs out there are researched uh, with graph databases. And a lot of the modern research of anything really is actually driven by graph research. So what it does is it extends the reasoning from a single entity entity to reasoning about an entity in context, in context of all of its relationships. So relational database systems, very, very necessary inside of enterprises, of course, and they're really great when you care about those individual records. So for example, if you want to insert and retrieve information about individual products, relational databases are great for that. On the other hand, graph database is great at capturing those dependencies between entities and extending the reasoning from a single entity to reasoning about an entity in context of relationships. So I'm going to expand a little bit more on relational databases. And one of the big things that graph does over and above relational data, data, databases is that it helps you avoid complicated joins. We've all written them, right? I certainly have <laughs> joins that go on for pages and pages that involve dozens and dozens of tables. But graph databases are great for avoiding this. If you've ever written anything like that or anything like a self-referencing, self-referential -refer join, you know, a table that is joined to itself to simulate something like a graph traversal, like you might think of, oh, a ta um, how about a, an org chart where there's the CEO, there's people that report to him or her, people report to them, people that report to them, and on and on. And for some organizations, that goes on for quite a ways. Turn it, you turn this from lots and lots of code and complicated code to a line or two in graph. And in previous incarnations of my graph talk, I've proven this out and, and measured some, some complex joints and so on. Won't do that here, but that is very much a true statement. Relational database systems are great if you care about those individual records. If you want to insert and retrieve information about individual products, they're great. But graph databases, again, we're going to capture the dependencies. And in a graph, you can simply add new nodes and evolve your application. Now, I'm going to preempt a question that you may have that I usually get around this time. And that is, what about what the relational databases are doing for graph? Well, what they're doing is they allow you, some of them anyway, they allow you to point to certain tables and say, there are my vertices and there are my edges. And I have a few graph algorithms built in here. And so off with you, go and do it. There's the data, but the data is not organized in a graph way. So the performance tends to be very degraded compared to a graph database. And what I've found is that some organizations that have gone that way have wanted to go further, but the performance has been a limitation. So in general, I'd like to say that if it's sort of a low level, maybe wet your, wet your toes in graph kind of uh, application, sure, try it out with our, your relational database and what they're providing with graph databases or with graph. Um, but otherwise, uh, the graph database market is very robust. And it's not, again, it's not like we have one size fits all anyway. So uh, graph databases make an excellent addition to most organizations. So there are two types of graph. The first one I'm going to talk about is the property graph. And this is what's called a domain model. This is your modeling aspect of a graph database. So you may want to model your data, something that looks like this, before you go plowing it into a graph database, see what those entity or the, those domain relationships are going to look like. This is north winds for anybody that's familiar with that. And essentially here, the vertices are your major nouns of the business, your, your things of the business. And we see a lot of them here in this graph. Supplies, products, shippers, regions, etc. So they're the major nouns. Now the attributes are on the edges. So there is that too, the edges being the relationships. You have attributes on the edges. And this is one thing that's going to uh, differentiate this type of model from the next one that I'm going to show you. So the property graph, again, has entities, which are called vertices and, or nodes, and links between them called relationships or edges. Nodes and relationships can also contain properties and attributes. These are not, I would not use the property graph for, um, 
things that have billions of rows and billions of uh, nodes, I should say. Uh, and essentially what we're talking about, there are events. And there are many graph databases that capture events, but most of them fall into the second category that's going to perform a little bit better at that level. But the property graph that we're looking at here is very accessible, very understandable. It's close to what programmers are used to, what you all are probably used to uh, in the database world. It's closer to a relational database. It's easy to get started, and you get some really cool graphics right out of the box. And for this model, we're talking about Neo4j, we're talking about Tiger Graph and some others. And the languages that they use are called Tinkerpop and Gremlin, Cypher and AQL. And uh, I, I used to show examples of that. I won't, I won't do that here, but hopefully you get the idea. Now, the other type of graph for which there are a lot more graph databases in the market because it's based on a published paper is called Semantic or RDF Graph graphs. So a semantic representation has what's called triples. And the triple is a subject, predicate, object. And here we see an example of three triples. Triple number one is the subject is John Peterson. And the predicate is knows because he knows, apparently, Frank T. Smith. So that's your first triple, simply put. Uh, now, in an RDF graph, you cannot have attributes on the edges, on the relationships. And so for that, you have to fork off another relationship, a relationship from that relationship. So triple two, in this case, is the subject is actually triple one. It's the relationship between the vertices of triple one. And the predicate is, let's say, confidence percent, and the object is 70. So on and on and on and on. And these are great for scalability. These are great for events. Um, some are... You might hear quad stores, which also store fourth property of the graph, but essentially it's the same thing as what we're looking at here. This is a graph database using the W3C standard stack, including the RDF resource descriptor framework, as well as many other standards that will be described as we go on. Some of the examples of things that, that you need this for, this type of uh, graph for, that are really going to scale over a billion vertices and edges, so stuff like world air traffic con control, global financial transactions, world internet connectivity, world airline and airport connectivity, large social networks, web traffic, global trade, global telecommunications networks, and national energy grid, stuff like that. And the language used here is Sparkle. Now I'll mention for the first and maybe last time today, this concept called a knowledge graph. So it used to be that people would refer to these RDF graphs as knowledge graphs, no matter what you put into them. But the terminology has kind of changed out there. And again, I don't like to establish terminology. I like to help you uh, with the terminology, terminology that you're going to encounter out there. And you're going to encounter knowledge graphs, which are essentially graph databases, and I would say of either type that contain knowledge about the corporation. And I'll just kind of leave it at that. Uh, you'll see the term kind of used and abused out there, so it lacks great true definition, and I won't go further with that. Now, visualization. This is one of the big benefits of a graph database. It may look like a jumbled mess to you right now, but if you knew what you were looking for here and you knew what these things were, and uh, as I scrunch my eyes into this thing a little bit, it looks like these are people. Yeah, these are people connected in some sort of social network. Think about LinkedIn or Twitter, something like that, and everybody's connected in here. Some people are connected to more people than other people. Obviously, everybody's connected to somebody different. We're probably connected on LinkedIn, me and you, by one or two orders, maybe even three, but we're connected. And the graph shows this, and you're able to navigate around, you're able to pinch and, and squeeze in there and get more information that way in a visual way. And a lot of people just really like this. Now, notice the coloring as well. There's blue, purple, green, yellow, etc. Uh, what the graph database here has done is it's seen that there are some commonalities here. There are some clustered up 
levels of people. And for my LinkedIn graph, for example, I might have a color for my Teradata context, a color for my IBM context, a color for this, a color for that, uh, and so on. So it's able to intelligently cluster up your con contacts as well, which is a great thing. Now the algorithms, they're so exciting. And this is where I say that even our relational database might allow you to do some form of these algorithms, but you're doing it on relational data, which tends to underperform. Now, I'm just showing you some of my favorites. There's a few more, but these will help you get a real good grasp on the possibilities. Again, anything that has to do with a relationship uh, should, be, should be in a graph database and taking advantage of these algorithms. So the first one I have in the upper left is called PageRank. Some of you may have heard of PageRank. Very exciting here. So what's the, and I'll, I'll use page like web page, but it could be anything. Um, so what's the, what web page should Google point you at if you're looking up something like, I don't know, data warehousing? Well, it has to rank pages by that term. And so it looks at pages with that term and it looks at the clout that it has. And it has more clout based upon, simply put, what other websites point to it. Well, it can't just be any website that's really going to give you cloud. If you have high value websites that are pointing at your page, that's better. But how do we know how much high value those websites are? Well, same thing. What websites are pointing to it? And on and on and on recursively for about 20 levels. And you end up with uh, numbers that like what you see here. And that helps Google, for example, determine what page to show you, but it just helps prioritize everything. And anything that you're putting into uh, your vertices, it'll help prioritize that. And so it's great for that. There's also other algorithms I wanna share are closeness, which help you understand the closeness of any two nodes on the network. And also we have here in the lower right, I'm showing you betweenness. So, what is the betweenness value of any node? Well, that has to do with how much they are connector nodes between large clusters of other nodes on the network. The graph database can find them. We can kind of find them visually here, but the graph database can highlight them and assign numeric values and so on. So it's a wonderful thing. Here are a couple others. Cascading coefficient or cascading churn. So my example here is going to be telecommunications. So there may be a there may be a group of I don't know five people that I call on a regular basis. So when friends are in on an opportunity, uh, they tend to share that opportunity. So it's likely that if a friend of mine in my close network is going to churn off of let's say AT and T or T Mobile, what have you, that uh, I might get pulled along with that churn. And AT&T or T-Mobile, whoever would not want that, probably. So uh, they would have some outreach to do to me, but they wouldn't know to do that unless they knew that I was part of somebody's inner circle that was already making waves about churning or demonstrating through their lack of calling or their use of the call center, et cetera, that they are about to churn so cascading coefficient is really great for churning and preventing churn. And eigenvector, eigenvector, let me say it right, centrality is another one that I want to share with you. It's a measure of the importance of a node in the network. Now take, for example, the graph piece that I'm showing you here on the right side of the slide, where you see some people that are apparently important. They're sitting in the middle of a cluster of nodes. They're connected to everybody. Uh, but this poor person out here in the middle is only connected to three people. So that must be an unimportant person, right? Well, no, it has to do with who they're connected to. This might be, for example, the sales manager. The sales manager only talks to the account reps and the account reps talk to the junior account reps and so on, of which there are many, but the important person here, if you, if you kind of take a 10,000 foot view is that one in the middle. So eigenvector centrality helps you do that. Now, there are many other algorithms. I'll kind of stop here for now, but some of the others that are really cool 
are minimal spanning tree, shortest path, cycle detection, and maximum flow. So there's something, there's an algorithm out there for you, no matter what your uh, graph workload is. So how do you find your way into a graph database, into one of these use cases? What's the, what's the common measure of the use cases I'm going to show you? Well, these are them. If you have these kinds of questions, in what order did a specific set of events happen? If you care about that, a graph database may be for that workload. Are there patterns of events in our data that seem to be related by time? Hmm, are multiple things happening at around the same time? How far apart are two nodes and how strong is their relationship? What are the identifiable social groups? Remember the colors that I showed you before on that graph? And what are the general patterns of such groups? What, did, what do the groups do? And what, what does that mean that every individual in that group might end up doing? Do we like that? Do we not like that? How can we prevent it? How can we encourage it? How important is any given actor in any given network and event? Hopefully that came through a little bit on that eigenvector centrality example I showed you. What type of messages emanate from a specific area? Here again, we're trying to show some commonality inside of groups, maybe social groups. What, what is that group up to? And so for that, we need to know who's connected and how strongly they're connected. I'll have an example of, uh, of the how, strong, how, how graph databases show how strong a little bit later. But uh, I couldn't help but notice as I look back on our graph implementations, as I look back on the ones that I've been exposed to and read about, a lot of them have to do with playing defense. Yeah, playing defense for the company. And by that, I mean preventing risk uh, or ma managing risk, preventing churn, preventing uh, shrinkage, things of this nature that you're just trying to make sure do not happen. Now, there's plenty of offensive moves that you can have here. Also in terms of, for example, targeted marketing and so on will be some examples. Uh, I would also say preventive maintenance maintenance of any kind, really, that's part of defense. So graph databases are going to play a lot of defense for you inside of your enterprise football game. So how do you identify a graph workload? Well, when I hear these words, network, hierarchy, tree, ancestry, or structure, that then my ears tend to perk up. And I tend to think maybe we're talking about something that is good for a graph database. If somebody is describing their, their business issue in these ways, or if you are planning to use relational performance tricks, or if your queries are going to be about pathing, what's the best path? How do I get there from here most efficiently? Or you are limiting queries because they're so complex. Maybe you're doing the workload in a relational database, but it's gotten really complex when it comes to your queries. And when you look at your queries, you can see it has to do with all these relationship types of things. And if you're looking for non-obvious patterns in the data, you want the database to expose these patterns, a quick POC with a graph database uh, can be very impressive for all of these, by the way. And uh, I do a lot of POCs or MVPs of all data technology. And sometimes the graph database ones are the most impressive. And I would say some of the quickest to, to spin up for us. So. Keep that in mind if you're thinking, oh no, it's a big mountain to climb to, to actually even show this. Maybe not, maybe not. These are some of the major graph databases out there, just again, trying to help you find your way into the presentation. Uh, I'm not trying to advocate for any of these. The relative positioning of the logos means nothing also, by the way, in case there's any vendors out there. Um, but let me just share with you some things about some of them. Neo4j, the, the J is for Java. I don't know why we care about that, but Neo4j is the most widely used graph database. It provides asset compliant transactions and it has its own language called Cypher. And it's very much a property, a graph database. That's that first model that I showed you. ArangoDB, open source, uh, multi-model database. So that means it does other things. It does document stores and key value pairs. Uh, I had a presentation, by the way, in November on multi-model databases. So if you care about that, you might want to go back and look that one up, YouTube or dataversity.net. 
Azure Cosmos DB, again, a multi-model database, offers global distribution, auto-scaling, automatic partitioning, low latency reads, and transactional consistency. Good stuff. Tiger Graph is another document store, and it's open source, an open source graph database with great native parallel graph computation, automatic indexing, real-time analytics, horizontal scalability, and it has its own language as well called Graph SQL. I really like some of the things that uh, Tiger Graph is doing, uh, very much uh, leading out there in terms of some of the innovation. Amazon Neptune, fully managed graph database service offered by Amazon. And there are plenty of others too. You might uh, be familiar with Orient DB, Titan, Flock DB, Allegro Graph. Yeah, on and on. Most of them are RDF graphs. So your maturity, we'll see in the use cases, perhaps. The maturity model for graph databases looks something like this. At the very lowest level, you might just care about the visualization. You know, there might be users that want to pinch, they want to drill in, uh, they want to scroll around that graph, uh, and that's great. That's a great start. There's, a, there's plenty more that you can get into, though, like those graph algorithms that I was showing you. This is more complex functionality. For example, finding the shortest path between two cities. So shortest path uh, uh, and, and showing a relative priority of the vertices that I can't under I can't you know over, overstate that enough. People look at a graph and say, "Oh, I see the the relationships." Yeah, that's important, but also the relative value of each node in that graph is equally or more important depending upon the workload. And finally, you have graph AI and ML. This is where you can really get some insights out of graph, where it can find and identify sub-communities within the graph and find little ecosystems that are in, in a big old graph and identify the players in that ecosystem and what's going on there and what's going to happen again. We're it's, it's a lot of analytics here. We're trying to predict the future. We're trying to understand what's going to happen and understand do we like that or not. So it's also this is also great. AI and ML is also great for entity resolution, which we'll see soon. And for example, it, it might identify nodes that if they're going to fail, the entire network is at risk. Very difficult to figure out uh, otherwise without a graph AI and ML. Identifying those choke points. So graph machine learning, it's really training probabilistic machine learning models based upon the graph. So graph can provide lots of great input to machine learning algorithms otherwise in your enterprise. So let's talk about some of the use cases. Now, the I'm going to start out by just showing you some categories of use that can be applied to multiple verticals. And then I'll get into some vertical examples. So the first one here is fraud detection. Like I said, we're going to play a lot of defense with graph databases. So fraudulent activity frequently involves a number of parties well beyond the victim. <laughs> There's middlemen galore, potentially, and uh, fraudsters uh, all over the place. A graph database can recognize and connect multiple, for example, email addresses that are used by a fraudster to create fake accounts, for instance. You must be able to spot fraud as it happens. So those queries have to be really fast because the graph can process large amounts of data in real time. It makes, it, it makes itself uh, ideal for fraud detection. So storing all historical transactions, thinking about which ones were fraud, looking at the patterns, bringing those patterns to bear on transactions happening right now and determining what you want to do about it. That is fraud detection and a graph database has all of those characteristics. Entity resolution. This is another category, very important category for graph. It's uh, the ability to identify and resolve different nodes to the same entity. For example, occasionally, my last name of McKnight means that companies get confused uh, by, by my last name without, sometimes with, sometimes without a space after the C, sometimes capitalization is important and, and so on. 
And so that this really shouldn't be a problem anymore, but it, it, it still can be. And entity resolution can help with something as minor as that, but also something as major as contributing to the fraud detection that we just saw. So it's actually quite a challenge to turn all this information into what two, what two nodes or, or 20 nodes are the same entity. So if you wanna figure out, hey, are those entities here actually the same? And there's no single identifier that we can use to do that. So it's really a wide range, which is why it feels so, so fundamental. Entity resolution, you have multiple choices of how to build that. In the end, you can write a very complex SQL inside a relational database to give you that kind of context. That might be pretty cumbersome and hard. And let's face it, if something's hard, it either doesn't get done or it's very hard to maintain. And so it, whatever it does finally get done, we tend to walk away from it and say, okay, it got done. I don't wanna see that again forever. On the other hand, we can also use graph analytics. So we have some customers who actually use that to do entity resolution. Now, the Louvain method, not on the slide, but that's an algorithm to detect communities in large networks and resolve nodes to a community. It creates a modularity score for each community where the modularity quantifies the quality of an assignment of nodes to communities. So this means evaluating how much more densely connected the nodes within a community are compared to how connected they would be in some sort of other random network. So it really helps to identify communities and the participants in that community. The Louvain algorithm is a hierarchical clustering algorithm that recursively merges communities into a single node and executes the modularity clustering on the condensed grass. And I did not give Louvain uh, justice with the French pronunciation there, but hopefully you can identify it when you see it. This is great for, think about entity resolution. It's great for cyber fraud, financial services, offering the you know, right next best product for them, uh, the supply chain, making sure you got your product set straight, customer identification, making sure you're identifying the customers correctly. So a lot of enterprises are using graph for this. Now, here's another kind of general, my last uh, general one, actually, network attack. And it, this applies to anybody that has a, a network. So you've identified an attack on your network, and now you want to find similar patterns in your graph. And this would look like a similarity algorithm being applied to the data, which we saw some of those earlier. Whereas we don't just look at the node itself, but we look at the nodes of context. Using a graph database to support a network attack prevention use case would involve designing a graph schema to represent the different nodes and relationships amongst the entities in the network. And we're talking about switches, routers, et cetera, store the data regarding the traffic flow, use analytics and machine learning techniques to identify malicious activity, uh, and so on. So again, you can map your network into a graph, and then you can map the activity on that network into the graph, and that can help you identify what's the good, what's the bad activity here, and most importantly, what activity do we want to allow and or do something else about as we see it. Now, healthcare fraud, one I've had the pleasure to be involved in one of the implementations for with Graph. It's actually quite exciting. Now, there's a lot of different types of nodes on one of these graphs. They're not homogenous at all, very disparate. So you got your drugs and treatments, you have prescribers and consumers, doctors, pharmacies, medications, and so on. And so what we see here is an example of, you see the lines between the nodes and some of them are thicker than others. And it's called out here as excessive relationships. Yes, too much merits further investigation. And this is where, this is the type of graph that we use to identify what the pill mills are. I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Uh, those pill, pill mills will uh, dispense certain controlled drugs like candy. And that can be a problem on many levels, as you can imagine. So 
with a graph monitoring all the activity in the network, we can see where the line is getting way too thick and do something about that. So that's just one example. There's, there's actually a few cases of healthcare fraud. That graph is grateful. Online shopping, we all do it. And a lot of that fast context is brought to your shopping experience. You might like this, or this goes with that kind of thing uh, that comes from a graph database. And in order to do this, you need to be able to, or it needs to be able to recall past similar interactions, not just by you, but by people that are like you. And who is like you? Well, that depends on different things, depending upon the, the context of the interaction. Sometimes somebody that lives across the street from you is someone like you, no matter what they look like. And sometimes it's somebody on the other side of the world because they look like you. So it all depends. But identifying like people is one, one aspect of this. And then identifying the right product to pitch, show, et cetera, et cetera, is the other thing. So you need probabilistic models. So this brings to bear your product catalog, which is frequently in a graph database, and also all manner of shopping attributes. So also when a shopper searches for something like red purses, for example, the app also knows what details to ask about next because it knows all the attributes that are associated to red purses. What kind of red? Uh, how big for the purse? What type, style, brand, size? Uh, what's your budget? These are all nodes in a, in a property graph for that. Property graphs are behind a lot of online shopping experiences. Also, as it accumulates this information by traversing through the graph, the application is continuously checking inventory for the best match. You can see there's so many application of graph databases. This is real-time decision-making. And this also applies to something like Uber Eats, something like that, where it's essentially online shopping, but it's for food. And that's become quite big lately. Now, a major insurer, another Another use case I had the opportunity to work with. So we're trying to play defense again, um, get insight into the risk environment. What risk? Risks like people appearing in multiple policies and claims. There's so much fraud that can go on here. Premium leakage, i.e. you're underestimating the mileage, undeclared di drivers, false garaging. Yeah, I really live across town, uh, but I'm here, you know, that sort of thing. Um, all sorts of pre-existing condition type of things as well. Padding claims, policyholder graph with the risk indicators is what's called for here. So bringing all the customer data into a graph database allows them to reveal the true risk exposure and detect uncovered risks or overlapping coverages, in particular in a motor or household context. By starting with their location, the address they live in, and the other people that appear to be living in that address, working at the same workplace, connected on social, people you're hanging out with, et cetera, you can quickly start to build a picture of the kind of relationships this person has with other people. And that is something very important. And there are various ways that we can identify behind the scenes who is in a network, who you hang out with and so on. Obviously social is, is a big part of that. Um, uh, geolocation is a big part of that. Uh, the use of credit cards at the same time in the same place, that's another part of that. So insurers can start to see what your network is. They bring in third-party data for a lot of this and it's gonna drive a lot, of, uh, a lot of coverage, especially as we go into the future. Television, magazine, and media. Analyze content and consumption for personalization. This is the personalization journey. So one company, for example, began leveraging a detection algorithm called Weekly Connected Components to find subgraphs within their multi-billion node data set. This is a huge media empire that can be attributed to distinct profiles. They then use the more accurate profiles to create distinct audience segments, which is the holy grail of any media properties advertising business, identifying audience segments down at a granular level. Now, Nielsen 
happen to be a, a former client. They are the leader in measuring digital audiences, guiding around half of the advertising sales tied to streaming platforms, but many streamers like YouTube, et cetera, use their own yardsticks. And so you're not, you're not just using your yardsticks to gather the information, you want to figure out what to do with the information. So what's the next best thing for Netflix to post to you, for example, and handle you in that way? Preventive maintenance. And in a car example, the radiator in a car, which is actively dissipating the heat that builds up in the cooling system as the coolant runs through the radiator, the walls of the those passageways start to develop a, some residue and debris running through that cooling system may also cause a blockage. And this is not a good thing. When this happens, the radiator's cooling abilities decrease and you're likely to overheat. So when one component fails to work properly, other parts throughout the cooling system also run the risk of failure. Well, what other parts? Well, based upon your history of failures and your history of maintenance and what you know otherwise, which can all be plowed into a graph database, those parts that commonly cease can be identified, so let's say after a radiator goes bad, the thermostat, the water pump, and the heater core. But with graph IDs, with graphs, you don't need to know this the graph itself will identify what the similar parts are. Pharmaceutical research, very exciting, very exciting things going on here. They, these, these companies deal in easily in the billions of nodes. They need to share their research throughout disparate parts of what uh, commonly is a large company to increase the research and operational efficiency, increase the output, and accelerate drug research. They really like the visualization cap capabilities here of graph. The scientists are using it a lot. And think about one of the things that they're working on very hard uh, these days, and that's DNA. Think about that data set. That is a data set. I think that's a, a strong data set for the future, a strong third-party data set that, uh, that is coming. And I've said a lot about this otherwise, but I'll just say about it here that DNA contains all the genetic information necessary for an organism to develop, function, and reproduce. DNA encodes the information as specific sequences of nucleotide, nucleotide bases. Scientists have found the first genetic instructions hardwired into human DNA that are linked to things like being left-handed, for example, and it'll go on and on from there. Cystic fibrosis, sickle cell disease, and so on. So overall, this is a great thing. And but you have companies that need to share research from disparate parts of the DNA. Each company is working off of, or each aspect of the company department, if you will, working off of different DNA segments. Person has a total of 46 DNA segments, 23 pass from each of their parents. The DNA letters that mark the spot of the cystic fibrosis, for example, it's that gene is one out of three billion letters in the human genome just impossible to deal with on a human level. So a lot of those are in graph databases. And finally, anti-money laundering. This is also an exciting use case. Again, we're playing defense, sorry about that, uh, if that's a problem, but we have to do it. Money laundering conceals the origins of illegally obtained money. So this might be through insider trading, drug trafficking, kickbacks, and extortion are examples of crimes that require laundering large sums of money by principals through agents. And the agents might be individuals, corporations, financial institutions, or law firms. And the graph unlocks the wealth of insights found by pattern matching on connected people, companies, financial institutions, places and times in a financial network. Here again, we're using the graph to identify the close relationships. So two entities, for example, might make payments to similar counterparties and may be affiliated with the same legal entities. These two entities may be associated directly or indirectly with entities that are on a watch list. Maybe they have unknown ownerships, which are a red flag, or are located in high-risk geographies. A counterparty's initial profile might be limited to a few things like party name, address, bank name, et cetera. But over time, the business processes 
enhance these party profiles with third party data, information related to transactions and account activity and details learned by investigators of flagged transactions. So millions of entities must be resolved in real time for billions of transactions daily. And this all must be done very quickly. And these, uh, they're called guilty by association algorithms. And they include customers that are associated with watch lists like regulatory and law enforcement, negative news coverage watch lists, global and narrative sanction lists, politically exposed persons, high risk individuals, legal entities with unknown ownership, counterparties in high-risk geographies, and banks in high-risk geographies. So let me get you to some closing thoughts and bring in some other things that are top of mind out there, like LLMs. What about graph databases and LLMs? Graph databases combine domain-specific knowledge from a graph and general knowledge from an LLM by using relationships to link the two. For example, a graph might link an entity's properties from the knowledge graph to a definition of that entity from the LLM. In this way, the domain-specific context from the knowledge graph can be augmented with a general knowledge from the LLM to provide a better understanding of a given situation. LLMs. Now, let's talk about vector databases. As I look at the emerging vector database marketplace, and I'm looking at it a lot these days, um, I think that there's a, there's some risk here to graph databases, right? Because if you think about the capabilities here, think about a Venn diagram. And I'm not going to try to say how big each of the circles are on this diagram, but uh, there's graph and vector, and there's definitely some workloads today that you could go either way with. However, however, my guidance today is that they are best suited for different types of workloads. And I'll get to that on the next slide. But let's talk about vector databases in and of themselves. So this might be, uh, you might've heard of Pinecone. You might have you might hear about what Datastax is doing, what Mongo is doing, what Elastic is doing in this area. And it's like taking a, a vertice, uh, or let me use, more general terms. It's like taking a, a, an entity and, and breaking it down into uh, a bunch of numbers. How many? Maybe around 100 to 300 per. And this, this process is called graph embedding. And to me, it's kind of like preloading the entity with all manner of analytics that might be useful, that might be hard to do otherwise. And not, that just preloads it but it keeps it up to date. And so a lot of that information is, 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 has to do with related entities. And so vector databases are really good for similarity search. We find them in machine learning recommendation systems and similarity search algorithms. Graph databases do, do some of this as well, right? but they're less ideal for managing very highly dimensional data. And they're not as scalable in this way as vector databases. Items that are near each other in this embedding space are considered similar to each other in the real world and in our businesses. Embeddings focus on performance, not explainability. So embeddings are there for high performance similarity search. Graph embeddings usually have around 100 to 300 of these numerical values. Think of it as an array. And the area around the vertex is used to encode an embedding. That's called the context window. Some embeddings might only look at customer purchases from the last year to calculate an embedding. Other algorithms might look at lifetime purchases and searches that go back since the customer first visited your website. But these embeddings do take up valuable RAM so we don't want to go too crazy and embed things that we're not ever going to use in a comparison. When we want to focus on when similarity calculations get in the way of real-time response for our users. That's what they're about. And these graph embeddings can be used as an additional tool to increase the performance and the quality of the graph algorithm. So in other words, you can use both in the same workload. You can use the graph algorithms to come up with relationships, and that can be fed to vector databases. 
for more. So specifically breaking them out here, graph databases are better suited to processing data with complex relationships, whereas vector databases are better suited to handling high dimensional data, such as images and video. Graph databases are made for queries involving relationships, while vector databases excel at similarity searches. Graph, database, graph databases utilize graph traversal techniques to discover associations between nodes. Vector databases use algorithms like k-nearest neighbors to locate comparable vectors. Vector databases excel in handling complex relationships and interconnected data. They are particularly useful in scenarios where the relationships between entities are of utmost importance, such as social networks or recommendation systems. Now, uh, I said some words there that you've heard before in this presentation that have to do with the graph database. So again, this is my direction for you for now. Uh, I am going to watch this space. You are going to watch this space and see where vector databases decide to put their energies. I don't know that they're necessarily uh, uh, in any kind of short order looking to do all the things that a graph database does. I tend to think not. Um, there's so much that they need to do around their core knitting right now. But here we have another, yet another data platform that could potentially have value inside our enterprises. Uh, I might have added graph databases to you today and vector databases, which clearly merit its own webinar, its own hour, might be yet another. What do you know? Okay. In conclusion, graph is a fast growing data category. It's all about the use case. Good for graph. We saw some of these real time recommendations, fraud detection and risk, network and IT operations, entity resolution, and identifying relative importance. And we spent some time differentiating with vector databases. Graph databases are made for queries involving relationships, while vector databases excel as similarity searches. And I just have a quick minute for you here before I get to your questions. If you have questions, toss them in there. I'll give you a minute to do that while I show you that we've covered a lot of ground this year already in, uh, in everything really, but also in this webinar series. Um, there you see some of the ones crossed out. They are available at mostly at YouTube, also at dataversity.net, if you want to look back on anything, including this one uh, in a few days. But coming up in the next few months, next month, I'm going to talk about common misconceptions about master data management. I'm going to touch on organizational change management, open source versus commercial data quality, and strategies for machine learning success before the year is out. And we're already over halfway. What do you know? This brings me to the end of the formal part of the presentation. And I'll turn it back to Shannon to see if you have any questions. William, thank you so much for another great presentation. And so nice to see so many people on the webinar today who were on all day with us yesterday as well. I love that. And uh, there's a suggestion from Warwick on uh, a webinar on just vector databases alone, which I think is fascinating. I think we should look into that. Um, so William, diving in here, lots of questions coming in uh, super early even. So uh, have you encountered firms using KGs to help under knowledge graphs to help understand systems? Systems as being the software applications that produce the data in the databases. Did you say pharma? Was, was that your word? Sorry, did you encounter firms okay. using yeah, <laughs> knowledge graphs to understand systems? Um, Yes, uh, as part of network analysis. So systems are thrown in there with everything, every component of the network. And when you're monitoring your network, you usually have your systems in there as well that are being monitored as well by a graph database. So systems are a, a vertice type, if you will, in, in your uh, graph model and uh, definitely have a strong place in those types of graphs. Nice. And William, um, I'd like to hear about the supporting information architecture activities, components that are addressed to support the data and metadata of graph databases versus, say, traditional, relational, or hierarchical databases, either during this call or where I can find those best practices. 
Um, I whoops. think that could be a whole webinar, but <laughs> if you have that, <laughs> that could be a whole webinar. Um, lots of lot. I mean, I didn't really get into best practices here, um, but uh, hopefully, I got you started, and uh, and and you'll you'll uh, you'll know how you'll know what kind of the end game is that you're trying to get to. So there, there's a, actually there are some design decisions in in graph databases. There, there, there really are. There's there's no let up. Uh, when you move from relational to graph in terms of design decisions. Some people like to jump right into creating their triples and, and, and not having that domain model, but I always encourage, uh, let's build the domain model, know what we're doing, not, not even though we can put anything in our, in our graph, let's not put anything in that we're not expecting <laughs> that doesn't have a place in our, in our model. So maybe that's the old model first me coming out, but, uh, but yeah, you can definitely do that here. And I think it's a good thing. Indeed, yeah. And we certainly have some resources on uh, our site in addition to that. So, um, but diving in further here, William, um, what tools support the metadata for a graph database? Mm -hmm -hmm. Um, data catalogs do an okay job with it, uh, but it's that's more of a, it's not an not a um, immediate uh, port for for most of them. So that's kind of a down the line uh, enhancement that a lot of the catalogs are doing. So I would say for the metadata, unfortunately, it's got to kind of look within the tool, within the database itself, within its own catalog. And uh, there's some information there. There's information on the nodes, on the placement of the nodes, on what's being discovered automatically. Uh, by the database itself uh, running um, autonomously and things like this. But it's not really, in my view, and maybe I just don't focus on it enough, but it's not really rich in, in, in a lot of metadata that can be shared to other systems in case that's where they were going. Nice. And we've got about three minutes left, so I'm going to slip in another question here. If knowledge graphs are built around noun relationships, how do they address the issue of many names, nouns for the same data thingy? I love that technical term. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, this gets back to the, uh, the the modeling that that I recommend we do beforehand, where you where you reconcile all that, because if you end up with a graph that has that you're identifying multiple multiple vertices when they really are the same, then you're just asking for bad output and bad relationships to be developed and probably not the relationships will be as strong as as they should be uh, because you're you're watering down your vertices in that way. So just as we want to use graph databases to identify similarities, uh, in our in our nodes, um, we need to do that before we get into the graph database and make sure that we are implementing no no synonyms, no antonyms, no homonyms, none of that stuff. And, and William, um, are there some recommended resources to learn more about graph that you that you recommend? Um, I think several of the vendors have have good information like this. Um, uh, I'm an EOJ uh, uh, kind of person, so uh, I get a lot of good information there. They have a lot of good presentations, uh, and they've invested a lot in education for the market. So I would say that's a good place. Uh, Tiger Graph also has some good things. Really, really, they all do. So, if, so if you're interested in any one of them, I would start there, but you might you might find your way uh, for some basic graph information over to the Neo4j site. Yeah, I know they've spent a lot of time on uh, on education, and and as most of them have as well. Well, William, I uh, and everybody, thank you so much for another great presentation. But that is all the time that we have for today's webinar. Uh, you guys are just amazing. Again, I love seeing so many people on here today that were on here all day with us yesterday for Data Architecture Online. Uh, and just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants with links to the slides and links to the recording by end of day Monday for this webinar. And uh, so we'll get that out to you. Thanks again, William. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all.